you have your Bibles, open to the book of Luke uh, with me, and let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 39, and this is a lengthy passage, so just hang on with me. Uh, We're talking about the Christmas songs. I started preaching this last week, Christmas songs. There are four different praises to God, or what I'm calling songs, that we see in the story of Jesus in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. One is Zechariah's song that we talked about last week, Mary's song, which I'm going to deal with now, the song of the angels, and then the song of Simeon in the temple. So I'm going to break each of these down because I think each of these speaks something to us about the coming of the Lord and what it means. Amen? So let's begin reading Mary's story here. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. If you've been to Israel with us, we've been to this little town numerous times. Times and it's a beautiful little town. They went to the hill country of Judea to, a, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you're, think about this Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit. They had like their own praise party going on. Okay, so Mary walks in. Pregnant with Jesus. Here's Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary walks through the door. John the Baptist starts shouting. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women. Your child is blessed. Why, why, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And I've read this a gazillion times, and, but for some reason in my mind I was thinking that Mary's song was a response to the angel who came and told her that she was having the baby Jesus. But it's actually not. It's a response to Mary who was filled with the Spirit, praising the Lord. So it's like she's praising and Mary's getting ready to praise and they're having a praise off. So Mary responds and says, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Magnificat anima meum dominum in Latin. It's where we get the term the Magnificat, if you've heard it in prayers and maybe you come from a liturgical church, this is prayed as the Magnificat. My soul praises or magnifies the Lord. In Greek, megaluno, it makes God great. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He took notice of His lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy and He has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear Him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped His servant Israel and remembered to be merciful For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Can we say amen? Amen. This is Mary's praise. Mary's song. Everyone, like I said last week, everyone seems to be filled with the Spirit when Jesus comes. Everyone is giving a praise, it seems. Gabriel tells Mary, rejoice when he comes to her. Mary rejoices. Elizabeth rejoices rejoices. John the Baptist has the little baby in the womb, rejoices. Zechariah rejoices. The shepherds returned, glorifying God and rejoicing. Simeon now says, praise God, I can go home in peace now that I've seen this child. Anna rejoices, the old lady in the temple who had prayed for this day to come. And the angels show up and they rejoice. I think there's a theme going on here. And that is when Jesus comes... The response is praise. I'll I'll preach to this side now. I said I think there's a theme here. 
that when the Lord comes, it opens the doors and windows of praise. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's look at that first line of Mary. She said, my soul praises the Lord, or as some translations, my soul magnifies the Lord. What does it mean to magnify something? It means to make it bigger, make it larger, right? So we can see it. How many of y'all have a magnifying glass? No, I'm just kidding, but you do have some magnifying glasses. And you're wearing glasses, and then when you get to the glasses and the magnifying glass, you're getting old. I'm sorry. Anyhow, because we've been there. But. But magnifying glass, you pull it away, and it makes it larger and larger and larger. So I'm going to say it this way. Here's my key thought today. Praise makes God bigger. Praise makes God bigger, but we can't make God bigger than He is in His person. He is who He is. But praise makes God bigger in my life. Praise makes God bigger in my life. When I magnify Him and praise Him, I'm acknowledging His greatness and that this thing is in His hands and that now He has this and He's to be exalted and He's to be praised. It makes Him bigger in our lives. It makes Him bigger in our church. It makes Him bigger in your home. It makes Him bigger on your workplace. Wherever you lift up and praise the name of Jesus, it exalts Him and makes Him bigger. Psalm 34, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. In Acts chapter 10, after the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his household, it says they spoke with tongues and magnified God. In Acts chapter 19, when handkerchiefs and aprons were taken off the body of Paul and miracles were happening, the Bible says the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Paul even said in Philippians chapter 1 that Jesus Christ He prayed that Jesus would be magnified in His body. Amen? That He would be magnified, made bigger in His life. So you're coming and you're saying, why should we we worship God? Why should we praise Him? Well, out of this passage, I'm going to give you three reasons why we should praise or magnify God in our lives. Okay? Y'all ready? Okay, three on the front row are ready. Y'all ready in the back? Amen corner? Okay, first of all, we should praise God for grace undeserved. We should praise Him for grace undeserved. She says in verse 47, He has taken notice of His lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. Amen? We should praise him for grace that is undeserved. This term mercy here, you know what the term mercy, one definition of mercy is? It's kindness or goodwill toward the miserable. Kindness or goodwill toward the miserable. I don't know uh, what you think, but, but I believe everyone in this church today qualifies in the miserable category because all of us were lost in sin. All of us were headed to judgment in a devil's hell. All of us were bound in our past sins and the guilt and the turmoil of all of that, but if you've come to know Jesus Christ in your life, you have been set free. You've been set free from sin, from the judgment that was upon sin, from a devil's hell in the future. You've been made free, you've been called blessed, and you didn't deserve any of that. I didn't deserve it. I deserved punishment and I deserved hell like everyone else, but God came and had mercy on me, and pulled me out of that, even though I didn't deserve it. And I'm going to tell you something. If you have no other reason to praise God today, maybe everything went wrong for you this morning. Amen? Maybe you were planning on wearing your favorite clothes to church, and Thanksgiving done got to you, and you couldn't button the pants this morning. Maybe you burnt your hair off with a curler, and burnt the bread and tripped over the dog and 
Wife ran out all the gas out of the car. You had to siphon some out the old school. I don't know. No matter what's going on bad today, I, give, I can give you one reason why you should worship Him. You didn't deserve to be here. You didn't deserve the mercy of God. But He came and gave Himself for us. If that would make a wooden man shout, amen? That's worthy of some praise right now in this church. Just go ahead and give Him a shout. Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus said, I didn't come to call those who think they're righteous, but I came to call those who know they're sinners. Matthew chapter 9. I came to call those who know there are sinners. Ephesians 2, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love toward us, He saved us. He's rich in mercy. He's loaded down with mercy. When He comes walking, mercy comes walking. I don't know about you, but I need some mercy. Hallelujah. I love the old Phillips, Craig, and Dean song. Mercy came running. Like a prisoner set free. It came running after me when I didn't deserve anything. I could just preach this for the rest of the day. Amen? Second reason in this text, I think, why we should praise God and magnify Him is for His rescuing power. Notice what He says in verse 51. His mighty arm has done tremendous things, and He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. The last verse in verse 54, He has helped His servant Israel and remember them. There's, there's an idea going on here of God rescuing people. Now Mary realizes that this baby she's carrying is not just an ordinary deal. It's completely supernatural. But God is sending a Savior to rescue His people out of their sin and out of their bondage. And she links it, of course, to Israel because just like Zechariah did, they were Jews. They understood the history of Israel. They understood the covenants of God. So she's linking this to the history of Israel that God has come to save Israel but not only that, I think every Jew realized the promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 was that through him all nations of the earth would be blessed. So not only is God coming down to rescue Israel, God is coming down to rescue all of humanity. This is what Christmas is about. It's not just about lights and candy and Frank Sinatra. It's about God coming to rescue the lost. To fulfill every messianic and salvific promise he had in the Old Testament. He's coming to fulfill all of that. And he's doing it in this mind-blowing supernatural way of letting a young virgin peasant girl get pregnant with the Son of God. Hallelujah. God coming in flesh. He didn't send His best angel. He didn't just send an uh, old prophet up in heaven. No, He came down Himself in the form of a servant, in, the, in a humble form, born in Bethlehem, wrong side of the tracks, coming down to rescue humanity. Somebody better give Him a praise this morning. Can you just lift your hands and say, thank God for your mercy and thank God for your rescuing power. Now there's a third reason in this text, I believe, why, why we should praise God. And this one's going to stretch our faith a little bit. But notice the last verse, verse 55. Mary says, for He made this promise to her ancestors, to Abraham... We understand that. She understands the promise goes all the way back to Abraham, where Abraham was promised the covenant. But then she says, and his children forever. So God is a God of the past, that we know He's done great things in the past, but now she's saying, now I realize He's going to do great things in the future. So let me just lay this on you here. I think we need to praise Him not only for what He's done for us, but also by faith for what He's getting ready to do in our lives. I praise Him for undeserved mercy. I praise 
I mean, we praise Him for the past, right? We can all come in this morning and get excited about what God has done for us. All of us, I'm sure, have testimonies that we could share of God's power, of His saving power, of His healing power, His touching power, whatever He's done for us in the past. It's like, it's like when Moses brought the children of Israel over the, across the Red Sea and they came to the other side and uh, Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the sea and then on the other side his sister Miriam took up the tambourine and they began singing and they began praising God. Hallelujah. They began dancing. I mean, they, why? Because the rider and his horses have been thrown into the sea and God, you're a mighty man of war and you've brought us out. Hallelujah. If no other reason, we can praise Him for what He's done in the past, right? But now this takes us another kind of faith to begin praising Him for what we are believing He's going to do in our future. Jesus taught this simple little truth in Mark chapter 11. In verse 24, He said, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe you receive them, and you will have them. Believe you receive them, and you will have them. We live in an evidence-based world. Even research I do is evidence-based. We look into history, and we look for themes, and we look for words, and, and then we can write a research paper based upon the evidence that we've discovered. And we can document it all with footnotes and sources. Science works the same way. We do an experiment in the chemistry lab. We titrate this. We add this in. We do this. We boil off this. And then we document the whole, whole time through. Then we come to a conclusion that based upon this evidence, now we can make a conclusion. It's humanity. It's the way the world works. And it's the way our brains think, right? We think on this evidentiary basis. However, Jesus turned the tables. He didn't say, believe when you see me working miracles in your life. Believe when you see God showing up and doing this. No, He said this. He said, believe first. Believe first and then you will receive whatsoever you have believed. Did y'all get that? Did the amen corner over here get that? We believe first and then we receive. And Jesus also in the same passage linked it and tied it all to what we say. In that same passage He said, You shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and then he made an astounding statement that I still work with today. And he said, and you will have whatsoever you say. Oh, hallelujah. It's one thing to say, hey, I'm believing with you, Brother Hans. Praise God. It's another thing to say, I'm believing with you, Brother Hans, and I declare. This thing shall be done in Jesus' name. I, I, I've known some people that have prayed for the baptism in the Holy Spirit and prayed for a considerable amount of time to be baptized in the Spirit. And then something happened in them to where they got to the point where they said, I'm going to church tonight and I will receive the baptism in the Spirit. I was in a prayer meeting one time. And in this prayer meeting, we had a young lady in the meeting who spoke up and she, she shared her need about how she was having a difficult time praying. That it seemed like her prayers were not going any further than the ceiling. And she wanted us to pray for her. We're all sitting here in the meeting. And then I had this, this Mexican lady with us in the meeting. And she turned to her and she said, Tonight you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thought, okay. The floor is yours. <laughs> I thought, wow, what a bold statement. And I thought, okay, what are we going to do now? And I, thought, I said, well, let's gather around our sister and let's pray. Guess what? We laid hands on her. Boom, she received the Holy Spirit. 
it came in such a beautiful, gentle way. She came back the next week to the Bible study, and I said, would you like to testify? She said, it feels like heaven has been opened in my prayer life. It feels just like heaven has opened. Come on, when you get hungry enough that you start declaring things, it shifts the atmosphere around you. Because some people say they believe, but there's no evidence in their language because the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But when you really believe, it starts oozing out of your mouth what you believe. So how is this related to Mary and to Christmas? It means I want to challenge you guys that when you pray or when you praise, start believing God for things you've been asking for and standing on the Word, right? Start believing God for things you've been praying. God, I thank you that you're opening doors. Hallelujah. I'm going to shout right now for a new car. I'm going to shout right now for a new job. I'm going to give Him praise right now for breakthrough. I'm going to praise Him right now that my kids are going to be saved. I'm going to praise Him right now that my family's going to come to God. I'm going to praise Him right now for deliverance. Hallelujah. I'm going to praise Him right now for a church that's so packed. We're going to have to have the police out here helping us park all these. I'm going to praise God for other campuses coming online. I'm going to praise God for the mission work we're getting ready to do that we haven't even seen yet. I'm going to give Him praise in advance. <laughs> come on, somebody. Shout Amen. Think about the life of Abraham, that Abraham, God went to Abraham and said, man, I'll tell you what, all this land you see I'm giving you. And not only that, I'm going to give you some children. He had no kids. He was barren. He he and his wife couldn't have children. But God came and said, I'm going to give you children. He said, not only that, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And your children are going to be so numerous They're going to be like the sand of the sea and the stars in heaven. You're not going to be able to number them. Could you imagine receiving that promise? I mean, Abraham was probably like... Because, you you know, having a son in that culture and leaving... Oh, man, even more profound than it is today. But what happened? After he received that promise, nothing happened. But he just kept walking. And he just kept walking. 25 years go by and nothing has happened. And finally the Lord shows up again. And he meets him in his tent. And as any good wife, Sarah's listening behind the tent. (laughs) And the Lord knows she's eavesdropping, but it's cool. The Lord says, Sarah's going to have a son. Sarah's behind the t- <laughs> Oh, man. She starts laughing. And the Lord says, and his name shall be Isaac. Yes. Why? Because Isaac means laughter. So every time you speak his name, you're going to think about the ridiculousness of my blessings on your life. <laughs> and what happened? That son came, right? After years, after years. But according to the New Testament, the Bible says Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. Even though he didn't see the Son, he kept thanking God. And he kept walking in faith. Even though he didn't see the manifestation, he kept thanking God. And he kept walking in faith. Because the Bible says we inherit the promises through faith and patience. Book of Hebrews. So faith and patience, we walk. And during that walking, we need to do a little praising for what we haven't received yet. We need to do a little thanksgiving for the things we believe that God's going to bring into our lives. The prophetic words He's spoken, we begin declaring those in prayer and in praise. I knew a lady at one time, she's now with the Lord. She had traveled to I don't know how many nations of the world, impact wrote books that touched millions. And she said, when I, I wanted to go to a new nation in the world, I'd write that thing down on a piece of paper, I'd put it in the floor, and I'd just dance around it. Start worshiping. And God would open the door for that nation. A mentor of mine back home in the mountains, 
He was a motorcycle rider, you know, back in the day. He wanted to get back into it so he could preach to bikers. And he said, I had this vision. I wanted to preach to bikers, but I was riding a Honda. <laughs> and he's like, if I want to have any street cred, I'm going to have to get on a Harley. I'm sorry, I'm a Honda guy too, so peace out, right? So he writes all this down. I want a Road King Harley. And by the way, I need a television show. And by the way, I need the monthly bill for that television show to be paid. So he wrote all that down on a piece of paper. And he said, Brother Hans, I laid it in the kitchen floor and I started dancing. Your family might think you're crazy, but who cares what they think? And you just keep on praising him. Phone rings. And someone said, I have 20000 for you. So you can buy a motorcycle, and I'm going to sponsor you on a monthly basis so you can go on TV. And now for 20 years probably he's been on TV ministering to bikers. Biker gangs call him to do outreaches, and he's sitting on the seat of a white road king. Why did I tell that? Because somebody needs to hear it today. Your faith needs to get up and elevate a little bit. We're going into 2020, and you need to get on another level of faith. Hans needs to get on another level of faith. We need to get up here into a new realm of what God wants to do in our life. I think we're limiting the Lord by our littleness or lack of faith. How many times did Jesus come and rebuke the disciples? He walks in after the resurrection. Walks into the room. It's like boom. And what is the first thing he says? Mark says, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Could you imagine? The first thing the resurrected Jesus does is come in, you guys didn't have enough faith to blow up a, anything. Where's your faith? How many times after this he calmed the storm? He came back into the boat and he says he upbraided them, King James, or he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Come on, somebody. Come on, let's lift each other up in here and let's elevate our faith this morning. Let's get it to the next level. Can you shout amen? amen? Think about the story of Joshua. I'm going to bring this to a close, but think about the story of Joshua. Joshua takes over the leadership reins of Moses. Moses was like the man. I mean, could you imagine taking over a position that Moses held? But Joshua was his military commander. Joshua understood battle strategies. Joshua now takes the rein. And he, as he takes the reins, he goes into his first battle, which is the city of Jericho. And I imagine Joshua understood everything about the military strategy to take that city. I can just imagine he was thinking, yeah, I'm going to place my, my, my swordsmen over here, and I'm placing my, you know, my archers over here, and I'm, we're going to... I, just, I, could, I can think he could just imagine it all. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him says, now here's the way you're going to walk into this battle. You're going to take the priests, and you're going to take the people of Israel, and you're going to march around the city on the first day, then you're going to go home. You're going to come back the second day and march around one more time, then you're going to go home. You're going to do this for seven days. Then on the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times, then, you're going to have a praise break. You're going to bring out the shofars and sound the trumpets. Then you're going to give a shout. What kind of battle strategy is that? I think it's a strategy where God wanted to see if they would trust His Word. And as they trusted His Word, He was going to do the work that they couldn't do. So they blew the shofars, they gave a shout, the walls of the city fell down and they went in and overran the city. Now in 1991 I was there at the archaeological digs of Jericho. And if I remember correctly, when we marched around it, they have these walls that they've discovered in archaeological digs that fell down, but they didn't, they weren't pulled backwards like the Romans did in, in Jerusalem where they pulled down, catapult up and pulled down. No, it didn't happen. It's like they imploded. Hallelujah. 
It's like they imploded and then they rushed in and won the victory. I don't know if you have a Jericho in your life, but I do right now. And I'm going to shout at it. Come on, how many of y'all have some Jerichos in your life? You need to shout at them. Praise in advance. Worship in advance. March around it. Declare the victory of God. Rest it in His hands. Hallelujah. Because He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. He's a mighty God of valor. Hallelujah. His name is El Shaddai. The God who is more than enough. Is there anything too hard for you, God? The, the, the prophet cried. He said, no, there's nothing too hard for our God. Jesus said with men, Things are impossible, but with my God, all things are possible. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Go ahead and begin thinking him in advance. Hallelujah. Praise in advance. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for doing miracles, for opening doors, for turning situations around, God. Lord, I thank you for coming and doing the impossible in our lives, God. Hallelujah. When they say there's no way, you made a way. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, there's no way out. God showed up in the fire and made a way out. Daniel in the lion's den, there's no way out. God showed up and made a way out. Jonah in the belly of the whale, there's no way out. God spit him out on the shores and God made a way out. Hallelujah. Jeremiah down in prison. Lord, I won't preach anymore in your name. But he said it got like fire. Shut up in my bones. And he came out and he preached. Hallelujah. In the face of unsurmountable obstacles, God showed up and always does what he says he's going to do. Come on, somebody needs to get turned up right now. You just need to get your praise on and say, God, start thanking Him for what He's going to do in your life. Make Him bigger. Magnify the Lord with me this morning. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, you got some stuff to thank Him for. You got some stuff to praise Him for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Stay with me. We're going to pray. But My good friend Doug Eccles comes here every year and preaches. And a lot of people don't know it, but Doug was born with a cleft palate. And his parents never told him. But his parents were approved by the Assemblies of God Mission Board to go to Africa. But they never told Doug because they canceled all those plans and stayed in America so he could have the appropriate surgeries. He found it out much later when he was an adult in preaching. But those, those, those parents, we, we were friends with them and we love them. They took him as a baby to an Oral Roberts meeting. <laughs> and Oral held him in his hands and prayed that God would heal him and said, this young boy is going to preach the gospel all over the world. And I talked to Doug a few years ago when he was going to Africa for the first time and he said, Hans, I feel like I'm fulfilling the desire that my parents had to go to Africa that they gave up to be able to get me the treatment that I needed and I thought about Bill and Dorothy, that's their names, his parents and how many times they thought God you've promised us something over this child now we're going, they pastored for over 50 years and we're going to pastor, we're going to preach we're going to believe that you're going to do everything you've said you're going to do even through the rebellious years, even through the not wanting to go to church and even forget that God has a promise and God's going to fulfill His promise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for Your promises to us, God. I thank You, Lord, that praise makes You bigger. God, help us to be more cognizant of that, that we praise You every day, that we praise You everywhere we go, that we become totally unashamed of what you've done in our lives. That we just become totally unashamed, God. That we live out loud about who you are and what you mean to us, God. 
Lord, I give you praise. Forgive me for not praising you enough and not thanking you enough for everything you've done and what you're going to do. God, I just, I just, I repent right now, God. I'm a thankful soul this morning. Hallelujah. I'm a thankful soul this morning, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had a friend years ago, and we're, we're planting a church, and 30 people's coming, and this guy's in this church plant with me, and he looked at, we've been together for years, and he looked at me one day, and he said, Hans, I saw a vision of you and your daughters. They were just little girls at the time. He said, they were grown, and they were on the platform with you, and they were beautiful. And they were prophesying. And he said, I saw you looking out over a crowd that I couldn't number. And this was given to me at as low of a point as I could get to, probably. Amen? So we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Come on, let's stop walking just by sight and let's start walking by faith. Father, I love you this morning. I bless you, Lord, and I thank you, God, for this church and all the precious people here, God. I pray that their faith comes to the next level this year. I pray that their faith comes to the next level. God, I pray we come to the next level this year. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching or listening to our podcast. I'm so honored that you tuned in and I pray the sermon was a great blessing to you. I don't know where you are right now in life, but I know one thing. God loves you and he has a plan for your life. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, how about praying this prayer with me, opening up your heart and inviting the Lord to come in. Come on, just a simple prayer. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you one of those whosoevers? If so, open up your heart right now and just pray with me. Just say, Father in heaven, I accept Jesus Christ into my life. Forgive me of all my sin and give me a new start today. In Jesus' name I pray. And you can say amen where you are. Please join us online for more information. We hope you come back and visit us. And we love you dearly. And go follow God and go into the destiny that he has for your life.